guys. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Ford. Um, I have six extremely talented filmmakers here. I just, I don't even know how we have this much <clears throat> talent under one roof. Uh, but I'm going to start right here with Chiwetel Ejiofor. You probably know him from his uh, very wonderful acting career, but he made his directorial debut uh, at Sundance this year with uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Up next, uh, Nisha Ganatra, whose wonderful comedy starring Mindy Kaling and Emma Thompson premiered here uh, called Late Night. <laughs> and Dan Gilroy, uh, who everyone knows is a wonderful writer-director, and he's here with Velvet Buzzsaw starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Rene Rousseau. <laughs> Lulu Wang, whose beautiful drama starring Aquafina uh, called The Far Farewell premiered at Sundance this year. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen Merchant, who's here with his film Fighting With My Family, uh, which stars uh, a small actor known as The Rock, you may have heard of, <laughs> and uh, Florence Pugh in a wonderful leading role. And finally, Gavin Hood, um, who you probably know from many of his films, but he's here with a new film called Official Secrets, which stars uh, Kira Knightley. <laughs> so guys, I have lots of questions for everyone, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of audience questions at the end. So if you've got something to ask them, we'll have a little time right at the end for that. Um, Nisha, I do want to start with the most recent news. Your film was bought in a very <laughs> exciting deal to Amazon. Yes. Uh, right, the, the, overnight uh, after its premiere. What was that experience like for you? That was, uh, I mean, it was incredible because you always hope that when you make a movie, you, as many people as possible will see it. But you also read about these Sundance midnight deals and the overnight bidding wars. And so to actually be like, oh, this is happening. This is a real thing that <laughs> goes on. And then at five in the morning, it was like, Amazon's doing it. And it was just like uh, your text messages and your phone just started blowing up. And everything was so exciting just to know that this movie's going to be seen by Everybody that Amazon reaches is incredible. Well, congrats. Awesome. I think. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. <laughs> so, guys, I'd like to start sort of with the beginning of the process for you. Um, how do you know when you have to make a movie, when this is a story you have to tell and you've got to do it no matter what? Who's going to answer? Well, <laughs> if I have um, mortgage payments, yes. I'm going to, <laughs> then I'll just take whatever's on offer. Uh, no, in, the, in this instance, this was a very unusual film because it began life as a documentary that was on British TV about this real-life family of British wrestlers. Uh, I'm not a fan of wrestling. I've never followed wrestling. And, um, and it was watched, not by me, but by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, uh, who was in a hotel room in England and saw it. And coming from a wrestling family, sort of saw this obscure little documentary and thought we could make this into a film. And so it's a very unusual kind of origin story because although it has Dwayne, who sort of you know is this giant movie star, it's this small kind of film for film developed from a documentary about this family of wrestlers from Norwich. And um, and I sat down expecting to sort of laugh and sneer at these people, and um, I was just utterly charmed and kind of moved by their story and their dreams and the fact that they talk about wrestling as, as uh, something which is going to change their lives in the same way that alcoholics can talk about God. You know, they talk about wrestling. <laughs> and, um, and these two kids who go off and try and make it in the wide world of WWE, which for wrestlers is the, you know, the Hollywood of wrestling. And, um, and only one of them got signed, the, the sister, and the brother got left behind. And um, so it had a lot of pathos and drama and sadness, but humor as well, because it's a sort of odd little subject. And, um, and it just somewhere on the line, it just really got into my DNA, and that was why I felt like it was worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Chibatel, how about you? Why was this? Th why did you have to make this movie? Yeah, I think there was, you know, um, the film *Boy Harness the Wind* is, um, you know, William Kamkwamba's incredible story of building a wind turbine to help his community get out of a famine. And um, I was, <clears throat> you know, uh, moved and inspired by the book. And uh, as I was reading the book, I was just trying to think, actually, as you were talking and uh, uh, asking the question, if I could pinpoint the exact moment in the book, really, where. I had, where I sort of moved beyond the kind of wider idea of thinking that this was a great and inspirational story to feeling that I really had to make it. And I think it's that moment of personal 
connection, that if you have that moment of really deep personal connection or where you start to really reevaluate your own life and your own experience through the experiences of somebody else. And, uh, and for me, that was, I think, in the book when William describes at 13 having been thrown out of school because his family couldn't afford the fees and, uh, and there's no free education in Malawi uh, above sort of seven or eight years old. Um, and him trying to figure out how he could sneak into class. And so wondering, you know, and actually then doing, actuating this kind of, um, if he could get in by recess and then maybe the teachers that would be looking out for, the ki uh, for a kid who hadn't, whose parents hadn't paid would be doing something else and he could sneak into the science class and so on. Um, and I sort of thought about what I was like at 13 mm -hmm. and what my relationship to sneaking into school, sneaking into mm -hmm. a science class was like and how completely inconceivable that concept <laughs> was for me. And I really started to consider the nature of that privilege and the nature of, uh, of that understanding in a fuller sense. And I guess that's what inspired me. And I just thought, well, I really actually want to bring that story, this story, this kid's ideas of the world to a, to a larger audience, if I can. And Dan, you uh, write scripts that you then don't direct. How did you decide you, you wanted to direct and write Velvet Buzzsaw? Buzzsaw? As a writer, I'm, you're looking for an idea that's like a documentary or something you see. You're just looking for some. For me, as a writer, I'm looking for something that that I know my voice was something that I will respond to. Uh, I right now when I direct something that I've written, I'm doing it to entertain people certainly, but I'm also looking for thematic relevance and ideas that are important to me. So when this idea came into my 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 world and I fell in love with it, and I thought this is a great entertaining film, and it's also something that I'll be able to use as a vehicle to transmit ideas. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing now for me is I'm not going to really write or direct anything unless it's transmitting an idea or an ethos or a theme that I feel is relevant, because this media is so powerful for change, and, and not just change, but to, to share your point of view, with the, and it's just such an opportunity to share your point of view with the world that ideas now, I define them when I want to work on them as, oh, that's I can say something without and then actually the hard thing for me, the editing process on this movie was cutting out all these great lines of dialogue that had all these ideas in them. They're like ornaments on it. And it's like you watch the movie, you go like, you don't need that message. You don't need that message. Just like it's getting through. I just, wanted, I just want so many ideas to come through and just share people with what you're thinking. That's really so. But the idea is to find them by their, a via, the potential vehicle to transmit an idea. Lulu, how about for you? This is a very personal movie for you. What made you say, I have to tell this story? Yeah, I mean, even as I was going through the process when I got the news that my grandmother was ill and I had to go back and say goodbye, but it was a wedding and I'm not allowed to tell her <laughs> that it's, uh, we're all there, why we're actually there. Uh, you know, in the process, I was actually in post on my first film, so I wasn't necessarily thinking, okay, this is a film right away, but even in just trying to grapple with the uh, ethics of it, and is, is am I crazy? Are they crazy? Uh, you know, I was calling up f American friends. I was talking to my family, and um, just trying to make sense of it all. Uh, so through that process, I was like, wait, I, I think I have something to say here. Like maybe it's all of it. Like maybe everybody's crazy and <laughs> everybody's not crazy. Um, and you know, I actually discovered that like because I had to not express my emotions when I went back to China for this wedding. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how to, I was going to be able to do this without just breaking into tears as soon as I saw my grandma. So I went to this like uh, media store and bought a little camcorder. And I thought, actually, you know, I'll hide behind my work. This is what I've always done is turn uh, situations and things into stories. And so if I do this, then maybe it'll help me control my feelings if I like am hiding behind a camera and through this lens. And so even through that process of like dealing with the actual situation, I n already started to get a sense that there was a story here. Mm -hmm. It sounds amazing. Mm. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I'm so excited to see this movie. I'm excited to see all these movies. It's like, I know what I'm doing when I leave here. <laughs> Uh, Nisha, tell me about coming on board. I mean, you know, Mindy Kaling obviously wrote this script. Yeah. How did you feel, find your your? How did you make the decision that I want to be the one that tells the story? I mean, there were the once uh, the words Emma Thompson were mentioned, then you're just sort of in. I think no matter what. <laughs> but I think with this script, it was it was beautiful because I think a lot of people forgot or didn't know that Emma started in comedy and that she started as a stand-up comedian. She was in an improv troupe in college, and she's just 
come along and such a brilliant actress that she's played all these um, period piece dramas and all these dramatic roles, but the chance to sort of direct Emma Thompson in a comedy was just uh, something I could not say no to. And Mindy captured, um, we have so many, as Indian American women working in comedy, we have so many similar experiences and she just poignantly captured them in a really funny script that um, is my favorite kind of movie where if you just want to go to a movie and laugh and be entertained and listen to a good story that kind of um, leaves you feeling uplifted, then that's what this movie is. But also if you want to look a little deeper, it does have something to say and is quite political and um, interesting too. So movies that work on both levels like that really are yeah. the, the joy for me and this script really captured that beautifully so I wanted to absolutely direct it. And Gavin, your film is based on a true story. Yeah. It feels very timely. Uh, why did you feel like you wanted to make this movie? Well, I'm glad I'm going last because I'm picking up on what everybody <laughs> said. Um, it is, to Dan and, and everybody, and to tell all, all you guys, it, it's about looking at, at a world in a way that you haven't before. The beauty of cinema and, and what we're lucky enough to do is you know, we all live our, our particular life, but the beauty of cinema is seeing life through someone else's eyes. And, and, and looking for themes and ideas and ways of being that challenge us. So um, in this particular case, um, this is based on a true story um, that took place right before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. It's the story of a British spy, a very junior British spy, working at GCHQ, which is the government communications headquarters, which is a very uncool word for the British version of the NSA. Somehow NSA, National Security Agency, just feels punchier than government communications headquarters. Hey, look, we're very classy people, all right? We don't, we're not going for these show-off terms. <laughs> exactly. and, 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 you know, very innocuous. What would government communications headquarters do? Write notes to one another. Well, actually, they spy and they do what the NSA does. They eavesdrop on your private conversations. They gather up information on your cell phones and your computers, and, um, and they hack you um, if they need to. So, but what was interesting about this uh, was that Catherine Gunn, whose, whose story we're telling, was this young spy, and there's been so much information out there about how we got into the Iraq war from a kind of macro level. And what really fascinated me about this story was going into that story through the eyes of a very almost ordinary person like us. Not quite, because she was a spy. But, um, but she was 28, and she found herself in the situation where she came across a particular memo that was sent to GCHQ by the NSA, and it basically asked the GCHQ to help spy on the private communications of UN Security Council delegates, particularly the non-permanent members on the UN Security Council, whose vote would be critical in swaying um, the council to voting for a legal UN-sanctioned invasion of Iraq. And had Blair and Bush got that, <clears throat> that resolution, um, all of the WMD issues, for those of you, a lot of young people here, maybe they're too young to even remember the Iraq war. You remember the Iraq war, somehow, yes. Anyway, so the whole premise of going to the Iraq was Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, and, um, and, but if you could have got, the two ways you can, you can go to war, and I won't be too long on this, but there are two ways you can go to war, legally, is one, the United Nations Security Council votes collectively that we have to go in and we have to solve this problem, which is what happened in Kosovo, right? If you get that, you don't really have to prove anything else because we as the United Nations agree that something needs to be done. The, uh, the other way that you go to war legally is self-defense. Well, if you can't get a UN resolution to go to war, which Bush and Blair couldn't, you need to say, hey, we're under attack. There are weapons of mass destruction that threaten us directly. If we don't stop it, the world's gonna go to hell in a handbasket. Um, so they really wanted this resolution and I shouldn't go on too long. This is a story about a young woman who felt that spying and trying to essentially blackmail smaller nations into voting for this war was just a bridge too far for her, even though she worked as a spy. And so she leaked this memo. And, um, and to be honest, why did I want to do it? At first, I didn't. I thought, oh my god, this is so complicated. There's so much research. And my wonderful producer, Jed Doherty, who may or may not be out here today, um, just kept going at me and saying, Gavin, you can do this. I'm, I'm an ex-lawyer by background. And it's a long way, and I thought I'd left it behind. And you know, it comes back. <laughs> so, um, so eventually, you know, I started reading and reading and reading. And the more I read, the more fascinated I became. And eventually, like everyone else, you just feel I need, to, I need to tell the story, and now you're in. And then you struggle to get the money. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about getting the money, because we're talking about 
mostly independent film here. Um, how, how hard do you feel like, as a director, you are in charge of fi that fight? Or do you lean on producers to help you? Have you had a frustrating experience where you couldn't, just couldn't get the movie off the ground or it took a lot longer than you thought? Lots Who's ever been frustrated getting much money? <laughs> Does that, that happen? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a vote. Maybe not when you're Dan Gilroy. No, you I'm kidding. <laughs> I've had my fellows getting money. I have, a for I have a formula, which I'll share. Uh, my formula is you get a script. In my case, I write it. Then you get somebody to do a budget. And you get the budget as low as possible. And then if you're lucky enough, you get the agencies and you find out what elements, like Chiwetel, of what they're worth, because everybody has a number. There's like a hidden number somewhere. And if you can get that element or elements, and they're more valuable than your budget, there are a lot of people who are going to be interested in making your film. There's, there's a lot of money sloshing around out there mm -hmm. in the independent world. And Netflix obviously has joined the fray. But, but if, you can, if you can get a script that you like, get the commitment of someone like Chiwetel, and, and you have a director, and your budget is a number that's credible, and the actor is worth more than the budget, people will want, people are going to be very, because it's a piece of business for them. For us, it's like art. We're talking about the themes and the art. There, there's people who make a living. This is assembly. OK, check that off. Because they'll take the worst case scenario. They'll take the scenario. If it completely fails, we know we've pre-sold it in 80 territories, and our, we'll have a thin margin of profit of $800,000. So for them, they're covered. But that's sort of, that's how I've approached the three movies that I've made. Yeah. That sort of process. But did everyone write down the formula? <laughs> <laughs> but I can't do all the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> um, I think oh, for, I mean, for us, we were definitely, the thing about the sale, too, was that we were seen as a risky movie because the lead was, a, you know, God forbid, a woman over 50 and then a woman of color. And it, female driven story, female centric movie, it was very. Um, <clears throat> It was a risk. And so that, I think, for it to be the record-breaking sale at Sundance was just a big validation that there are female directors. Yeah. yeah right. I think Yeah, and I think like I love that formula. I wish I could do you can't it. Do that for me. You know? Yeah, like <laughs> on my film, I was like, okay, so this is a story, it's gonna be 100% Asian cast, whether it's Asian or Asian American. Uh, I want it all authentic to the language and the accent, so 60, 70% Mandarin. Um, yeah, let's find a star who's yeah. worth the, uh, no, you know right. what I mean? It was, we and this was, apart. <laughs> yeah, this was before we knew we were gonna cast Aquafina. It was actually before she had done Crazy Rich Asians. Right. It was before Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. So, uh, my you formula have one is. Film for your formula? So what is your formula? <laughs> my yes. formula is uh, come up with an idea, uh, go to This American Life, uh, <laughs> <laughs> write and uh, narrate it, uh, have it air on This American Life, and then all the producers will start calling two days later. So, <laughs> so, so, so simple. So easy. So easy. This film business is so simple. <laughs> what? No, but in all seriousness, yeah. I think you do what you can. I mean, for other yeah. indie filmmakers, yeah. women, people of color, like whatever your stories are, I think what I discovered through this process is that there's not just one way to do it. Like if you have a story that you're passionate about, find any kind of medium, find a way to get your voice out there, and then if it resonates, it'll spread. But that's what we have to do. That typical formula for us, when you're put in our like, X's and Y's will add up to $2 because they'll say, oh, that woman's not worth anything, that person of color is not like her. You know, it just doesn't. It doesn't work for the kinds of movies. It doesn't work for everything. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you on Nightcrawler, I was ready to make, we made it ultimately for around seven or eight. I was ready to make it for like one or two. Yeah. I, I, there's, there is a budget number that if you're willing to drop to that budget number, <laughs> other yeah. options start opening up exponentially the lower you go. And then the question is, how do I make the damn movie for $750,000? Yeah. And sometimes you, you can, can totally pull it off. Four movies. Damien should two, <laughs> Damien's first movie, Whiplash, he made it for 3 1 yeah. off a short film. And I mean, you can do it. It's, it's, it's a man, but you just think the economics get small. But, but I, yeah. sorry. Well, I was just saying, but, but, but you know, our movie was originated by Dwayne, who, you know, by some metric is regarded as one of the biggest movie stars yes. in the world. Literally. He, he was going to feature, although. <laughs> um, he is well, the you say that, but he's six foot, uh, he's six foot five, That's I'm six true. foot seven. So. Uh, <laughs> he's, he, let's be honest, he's very intimidating by me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's embarrassing. Uh, I tend to sit a lot when I'm around him. 
<laughs> but, um, uh. but you'd assume that you'd go along and you say, well, okay, Dwayne's not gonna be the lead of this movie, you know, although he was in real life involved with this girl Paige's real life wrestling story. But he's gonna feature and he's gonna have his fingerprints on it. And, and, and that was still, it did, still didn't solve everything. Wow. And we, we went to film four and we had to, you know, they had a sort of amount that they felt they could give and we had to get money elsewhere. And so it, it, I don't think, you know, um, it, it still seems to me that it's a combination of someone like Dwayne in, in the right kind of running, jumping, shooting film. But you know, you put him in something else and, and suddenly people are a little nervous or how are we gonna yeah. sell this? So I, I don't know if it's ever painful. And getting and, and getting good collaborators with that as well. Mm -hmm. you know, that's also part of the, the process of having a good producing team. Because that's the thing, it's just accumulating those yeses, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And, then, and that sort of starts to snowball and that kind of moves. I think I was very, in part of the process with Boy Harness the Wind was definitely, even though I had me. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the numbers working yeah. very well. The, uh, were, like, you, oh, were, you, were you tough to get? For your <laughs> <laughs> were there some availability issues? And when they you, 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 you wouldn't say, read yeah. it. Just sat there for a long time. A couple of readers, you know. Um, <laughs> what is this? Thing? But the uh, but you know it's still a, it's such it's it's still a process and and finding people who who share your vision and who are going to go to bat for you and who are going to try and uh, and and join you in that search for the financing is. Uh, is, is, I mean, is vital. I think it's, right. there really is no one way to do it. Um, and I've done them, I mean, this film was political in nature. You know, God forbid you should examine anything political in Hollywood unless you've somehow landed every major star that you can. So we had to do it that way around. We, we had a budget and then we had, well, okay, just forget your budget. Nobody's like going to do this unless, you know, you get the yeses that Chewie tells Kuro. Well, when Kira Knightley signed on, that was a really good yes. You'd think that would do it, right? You'd think that would do it. Oh, no, no, no. Well, that's great. That's great. Who else? So we ended up, then we got, a, then we got Matt Smith, who's fantastic from, from the, absolutely wonderful actor, amazing. We thought we were done. No, 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 no. You get us one more. Get us one more. Well, eventually the one more, we had like this third act, amazing cameo part of this lawyer called Ben Emerson. Who are we gonna go to? Let's try Ray Fiennes. He's never gonna say yes, you know? It's, it's a, it's, he said yes. So I think it really is for actors, and there's someone who can answer this better than me, but in my experience with actors, it's about the material. So if you're not winning on the elements yeah. that are, now you gotta say this script has really gotta be good because what does an actor want? Something good. And, you know, and maybe a paycheck. But um, I, I, I've done it the other way around as well. My film, Tsotsi, many years ago was done in a foreign language with subtitles with not a movie star in sight. The lead had never been in a film before. But we had to make it for the right price. Yeah. We had to make it for under $3 million. And we had to find people who just loved the story and, again, the script and said, we believe in this and we'll do it. But there's no way we would have got, you know, even $6 million for that movie. So I think you've, you've also got to be realistic about what your project is and go in as Dan says at the right price. But try, yeah. if you can find a great actor that also has name value, of course that's, yeah. that's hugely helpful. Or Chiwetel. Or two, or Chiwetel. Yeah. Yeah. He's so, booked up, he's not reading anymore. He's booked up with <laughs> uh, So let's talk about the actors. Do you enjoy the casting process? Do you, Dan, write for an actor like Jake or um, how do you know that you have found the right actor for a role? Uh, in Velvet Buzzsaw, I wrote the part for Jake, and I wrote the part for Renee. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't know the other parts. I love, I'm married to an actress for 25 years. I love working with actors. I think this is a highly collaborative medium. Mm -hmm. One of the things I enjoy most is sitting down with somebody when you cast them, and like, I gotta be honest, I, whatever, however good a writer I am or not, when you sit down to a good actor, if they're a good actor, within a few days or a week, they know more about the character than you do. Maybe not more than the story, but they certainly know more about the character. And I am all ears when an actor starts talking about what they think is going on. And I love actors that challenge and question. And because it's only gonna get better. If they're good actors and you hopefully you've cast them, it's only gonna get better. Yeah. And uh, some directors just don't like where some uh, directors don't like where uh, they're scared of actors. Actors are scary. They ask really brutal questions. Why am I doing this? <laughs> and sometimes they wait till the day you're shooting. Because it says so here on the page. You've never done that. But, but, but you should. I'm sure you have. But, but no, embrace actors. They have, if they're good actors, embrace them. They're, they're invaluable. And, uh, and I got a great cast. I mean, I, Malkovich and Tony Collette and all these great, and Sally Ashton, it's incredible. I, I love actors, man, good actors. 
<laughs> Can we tell, Stephen, as actors, um, how did that sort of influence your style as a director? Well, I think it's, the, it's actually the, the same thing Dan's saying. It's just that sense of really, I think that, you, you, that embracing the process and embracing the collaborative spirit is a crucial part of, um, of I think, being a, a director and being an actor as well. You know, that, that, um, that understanding that individuals bring so much to the table, you know, um, and that actors can actually really influence from the inside the nature of a story with dynamics that are just kind of inconceivable, you know, to somebody, you know, somebody outside of that experience, you know. So, uh, and exactly in that way, actors are sort of forced to be sort of, um, you know, script editors sometimes and really work through all the things that they have done before and what has worked for them and then bringing that to your project and so sort of negotiating that. You know, the, the hardest experiences to go through as an actor uh, with directors who want to block that dynamic because they're kind of absolutely focused on whatever they believe is the, is the correct way, correct, you know, way to, uh, to approach something. And, um, and that can be very challenging and very difficult and very rarely is it successful, you know. So as a director, you know, what I wanted to do was absolutely open it up to the actors to bring all of their thoughts, feelings, expressions, to have takes that I didn't, you know, absolutely didn't say anything about it. You know, what, what do you feel? How do you feel it goes? And if there was something specific to try and move or change, or uh, then sort of discuss that and think about it and negotiate it. But uh, but give people the absolute space to to create. You know that seems to. Well, we 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 had a very tricky central role to cast because, as I said, it's based on this real life woman who's a working class woman uh, who, at the time that she went off to America to train as a, as a wrestler for the WWE, coming from this, this Norwich family, you know, she was uh, 18 or 19 at the time. She uh, ultimately became a big star there. So you needed someone who could both be this working class girl, but who had the charisma not only to carry the movie, but also that you would believe could become a star in this world that she's in. And she needed to wrestle on top. And so it was a really tough thing to cast and, and I must have seen sort of 60 plus wow. you know young British actresses in either in person or on tape and it was just hard to find that combination and, and uh, we ended up with this wonderful actress called Florence Pugh who has been here I believe with with Lady Macbeth and Lady Macbeth was a terrific film but it didn't tell me that she could do this part and it, it's no no there's no question about her talent it's just you know it, but is she right for this one and so you know I worked with her a lot and some of the other actors and, until they could convince me that, that this was the right deal. But like you were saying, you know, when, it's weird when you are an actor, you know, you hear those stories about, well, what's my motivation? Why should I cross the room? And, and you sort of think, oh, it's just actors being, you know, idiots. But actually, weirdly, when, sometimes when you are in the scene, it's only then that something occurs to you that doesn't feel right or it feels weird or you don't understand it and you can't move forward because you're stuck in that. And so like you say, you, you need to trust that the actor is not doing this because they're being a diva or because of ego. It's, it's just because something's not ringing true for them. And if you don't listen to that, you, I, I, don't know, you know, I don't know where you are. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, I want to go back on something I was saying about, about Kira and Matt and Rafe. And, and, and um, especially when you've written yourself, uh, Dan, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but there's some, there is a fear that you're going, to get, you're going to get rejected. Actors often come to auditions and think they're auditioning for you. The truth is you also feel like your stuff's being auditioned by them. Is my stuff working? Does it work? And, and you want to hear those. I actually love the audition casting process because I get to test my stuff before I'm actually shooting on multiple people. Don't tell them that. You tell you. But it's great <laughs> when actors come in the room and you're casting because you're going, is the scene going to work the way I've written it? Don't be afraid of that process because the other thing about being challenged, the flip side of having your producers, your financiers say to you, no, get, me, get me someone better for this role. And your instincts are, please, can I, I don't want to go through that trial or that rejection anymore. I have Kira. Can we just shoot this? We'll get, no, we want more. Now, in a way, then you go, oh, what you realize is, is my stuff good enough? You know, is it good enough to attract really good actors? Mm -hmm. And if my stuff when I'm sending it out, is being rejected. Oh, so-and-so passed, so-and-so passed. You know, there's a tendency to say, well, fuck them, you know. Um, but actually, that's not very wise, because maybe it's getting rejected because it's not good enough. <laughs> and, uh, and so as a writer and a director, you want to go back and look at that material, because the competition is massive. What's the number? 700 films made last year. 
did $13.4 billion, it's a record, except that half of that $13 billion, or at least a third of it, was 10 Marvel movies, so that leaves 690 movies competing for the other balance, of which most don't get a release. This is not a gentle sport. This is the Olympics, man. And um, maybe I'm overstating it, but getting tested in pre-production and during casting and going back is, is exhausting, but actually worth it, I think. Yeah. I want to hear about Aquafina and how you cast her. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. going to say it's. I mean, that's it's 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 terrifying because you don't know how it's all going to work out until right. like you're actually there. We had an ensemble cast, so we have Aquafina, who's known for comedy. And when we cast her, she hadn't even done Crazy Rich or uh, uh, Ocean's Eight yet. And uh, so when um, you know the producer said, you know, have you heard of Aquafina? And I was like, my vag. <laughs> they were like. I know it's unconventional, what do you think? Like, she loves the script, she'd love to meet with you. And I was like, oh, okay. Just didn't think, okay, yeah, all right, my badge, yeah, okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, my brother introduced her music to me, that's how I knew of her, was like through YouTube and stuff like that. And then of course she's like playing a version of me, and so it made me, I was like, D uh, uh, Danny, my producer, was like, how do you think do you, am I, okay, uh, like, you know, this is the person <laughs> that you, you're choosing to represent me. So then uh, Aquafina and I met up, and she told me about how personal um, the story was for her because she was raised by her Chinese grandmother, mm -hmm. and then she sent in her audition tape. And I just knew that the raw connection she had to the story was going to bring so much depth, and we couldn't green light the film even without having uh, the main character. You know, but then you go to China, and you're ca we're casting people from, like, local Chinese actors to play the grandma. Uh, we cast this soap opera star from China. We, you know, for the uncle, we, we cast this, like, dramatic actor. Uh, if tai Ma, who's, you know, been in Arrival, Meditation, everything. Rush Hour uh, as the father. We have an Australian Chinese woman to play the mother. Uh, and then I cast my real great aunt to play herself in the movie, non-actor. <laughs> she actually went through the experience herself. And I th always thought, you know, if she was just around on set, she would bring like a grounding to all of this and hopefully tie all of it in. And initially I thought maybe she'll play grandma. And that wasn't good because, yeah, that wasn't good. Because so, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, what does my sister do? And, you know, it was very like an imitation. And then I just said, what if she plays herself? And we had a long conversation. I said, put yourself back in the moment when you found out the news and you have to lie to your, you have to decide, do I lie to my sister or do I not? I felt bad. Like all the producers were there and we were like, we're putting her through this really traumatic revisiting of this moment of, and she, but she felt, she was like, it's like therapy, you know? And she wow. did it and it was so raw and uh, it was like, done. So, but then, you know, you don't see all of these people together until you're actually on set. <laughs> and we didn't want to start with these big ensemble pieces because we had very limited shooting schedule, as you know, with indie films. And then you have 13 people in a tiny apartment sitting around a round table. How do you do this? Like, do, do you cover it? You don't have time. No. And, um, and, then, and then also, how is everyone, what's the chemistry between the group, uh, it, between Grandma Billy, between, you know, and then as an ensemble, because the ensemble themselves is a character. The family is a main character in the movie. And so it, it's, it's magic. I think so much of it is, is faith, and you just kind of, up until two weeks before we started shooting, we didn't have Grandma or Little Nai Nai. Uh, the sister, the great aunt cast. And so you're just like, this, 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 this. All right, let's go. Boom. And you have no idea what you end up with. And yeah. So I think were, were you nervous about the fact that what if your aunt couldn't do it and you had to fire her yeah. or something? Because I put my dad in something once and we gave him lines. And on the day, he was hopeless. And I, had to, I, I ended up taking them away <laughs> from him. And because we did, it was such a low budget thing, my agent ended up doing the scene instead of my dad. <laughs> did he charge you 10%? <laughs> yeah, she did. I well, she a... kept saying that. She was like, you know, if I'm terrible, just tell me, just fire me. I was like, we've like been through the parks of the entire city every morning scouting cute old like Chinese ladies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. like you're the cutest. And <laughs> <laughs> You, we gotta make it work. And she was like, no, I'm gonna ruin your movie. And she's acting, her, you know, her sister in the movie is a really famous Chinese actress that she's like watched for no. years. Yeah, right, and wow. so she was like, I can't, my fat face is gonna ruin your movie. Oh. That's what she would always say. And we were like, no, you were adorable. And then when we told her we were at Sundance, she was like, I'm just relieved I didn't ruin the movie. Um, yeah.
yeah, she's, she's amazing, That's but great. a little bit afraid, but I knew she could do it. <laughs> so, uh, guys, I do want to ask sort of a broader industry question. Obviously, we've seen this business changing pretty rapidly the last couple of years with things like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and now Apple kind of coming into the business. A couple of these films are being released uh, through Netflix. What's sort of your view on how a movie is released, how you would want your movie to reach audiences these Ooh. days? Are you open to everything? Are there still preferred ways you'd want your movie to go? Well, I think for, for The Boy Who Honest the Wind, which is with Netflix, which has been very exciting and a great process for us, you know, the, um, uh, what it's made me think about is this opportunity to slightly curate the ideas of how you uh, distribute films and, uh, and that there's not a sort of, there's a kind of, there are options on the table and there's not a sort of one size fits all kind of uh, model. And so, um, so it seems exciting to me. You know, I, I wanted to make a film that was very specific and very authentic and about Malawi uh, and a lot of the film is in Chichua, which is the language of Malawi, and um, you know, and it's all you know set there, and it's very you know uh, detailed in that way. Um, but I kind of wanted a lot of people to see it, you know, <laughs> and uh, and in the early parts of the process, you know, when I was starting to write that, it didn't seem, it felt like that was a difficult thing to achieve. You know, I started writing it in 2009, and you kind of. Um, you know, and just working through the time, doing other things, coming back to it, and seeing the landscape slightly change, and getting to this point whereby there is an opportunity to have it, you know, to, for some people to see it in a limited way in cinemas, but also to actually get the kind of reach and the eyeballs on it that, uh, that were just was completely impossible um, a, um, a few years ago, and would have been extremely difficult within the model and the established theatrical models of distribution uh, uh, recently. So that's been exciting to me. I think that that idea of how we can curate that experience for the audiences and how we can then push sort of different kinds of material out there and, uh, and have different kinds of conversation is something that I personally am very excited about and looking forward to working with and seeing how these conversations can be productively handled, you know, so it's not a sort of us and them sort of paradigm, but, you know, I think that these things work together very well. I love the idea, for example, that with something like Roma, that people were going to see it in the cinema because they were more used to the idea of subtitles because they had been watching things like Narcos on Netflix, you know, recently. So that sort of way that it actually can, these things can sort of evolve and inform each other, I think, is a kind of useful way of moving forward. Yeah, I, th I think we're as lucky with Netflix, because it's, of course, old school, and I'm a bit old school, you know, want to see my film on a big screen, and I do. There's nothing more beautiful than sitting collectively with an audience and seeing a big, there's something about the intelligence of an audience that, goes up when they're all together, which is a bit more nerve-wracking. But they really focus. But having said that, it's a bit like sort of whinging about film versus digital. You've got to stop. I mean, the truth is digital now is amazing, digital cameras, and it's democratizing film in a way that it was never possible right. when, when we had film. And I think Netflix and what Chirtel's saying is doing the same thing. I mean, you know, 12 years ago when I made this tiny little indie film, also all subtitled in Sorti Tal, um, we were just hoping we'd get a release in South Africa, which is where I grew up, hopefully. And we were very lucky that it traveled the world because of festivals like this. Um, that, but the festivals like this were really the, way, the only way that you could get your film out in the world. Now, with Netflix and Amazon and these sort of companies, a smaller film can find a huge audience, whereas mm -hmm. Even when Tzotzi was released in America, it was released on two screens in New York and one in LA. Well, that's not really my target audience. Um, and I'm very glad that it then picked up and went on to many more screens and, and, and got a life and showed all over the country. But it, it, it still doesn't reach the audience that a Netflix can. And then the other thing, of course, is we're all buying these big TV screens. So it's not so bad. The sound's better. You know, when I was growing up, it was TV. And who wants your stuff on four by three? So I think. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Look for the place where you can best get your film out. And, um, and of course, it's wonderfully satisfying to have it on the big screen, but it's certainly not the only place. I think we, we get the best of both worlds with Amazon because they guarantee the theater release, so we get to, oh, wow. you know, that's the dream is you want to see it in a theater with an audience, especially comedies. I grew up watching comedies in movie theaters with audiences. There's nothing like laughing all together. And mm. so we get to do that, and then we also get to reach the whole world with Amazon streaming. So I think that's just... <laughs> the best of both worlds. Yeah, and I think above, like, more than just the theatrical, digital, like, all of that, like, yes, you want as many people to see it as possible. It's more than just platform. It's about, you know, who can handle the film, who understands the film, 
who's able to present it to the world? Yeah. Because so much of it is about optics, right? Like the farewell, you know, you have an all Asian cast, the, there's subtitles, people are speaking Chinese, but then you have Aquafina, who's this very big American star. So, you know, when you're in this like strange territory and they call you specialty, like how do you present it so that you bridge that gap? People aren't seeing it as a foreign film, that they're able to mm -hmm. see it as an American film. Because it is an American film, even though there's all of this other language, because it's from the perspective of an American, and it may not be the type of American people immediately think of, you know, like as a, as a lead or as a, a cast in general, but it is an American perspective. And in fact, you know, when people were talking about this film for the Chinese market, like I, I can't speak to that because I'm not Chinese. And you know, when we took, we were talking to people about the film in China, we were like, so then they keep the secret and they don't tell grandma, and they're like, uh huh. So. What, where's the drama? Where's the dr We're like, no, but they don't tell her, and she's dying, and they're like, and you don't do that, America? <laughs> like, you guys are crazy. You would just tell her? You know, and so for them, they're like, this isn't dramatic enough. This is what everybody does. Um, so That's yeah. like when my family in India thought Monsoon Wedding was a documentary. <laughs> 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 yeah, my dad was like, the story. My dad was like, this is so every day. Why is this interesting? Yeah. That's what he literally said. Um, I'm curious, while we've been here, there's been a movement happening um, with a lot of actors uh, agreeing to participate in something called the 4% Challenge, which is they'll agree to work with a female filmmaker in the next 18 months. Um, you know, as we know, female filmmakers still make up only 4% of the top films in, in the US. Um, I'm curious what you all think about that initiative and sort of what can be done to really you know, make, give more opportunities for female filmmakers. I mean, I think it's essential that they make these initiatives and promises and just shine a light on it because if they don't, it's just, it doesn't really draw attention. And the statistics, every year people seem to start to talk about female filmmakers and then every year the statistics actually go down about the number of working directors that are women behind the camera. And we all know now that who's behind the camera matters and it matters what perspective you're being given. It matters how the stories are being portrayed, how women's stories, particularly, if if they're objectified or not, it absolutely changes by whether a woman is behind the camera or not. And so I think those initiatives can only help. Yeah, I think it's uh, so urgent. And I also hope that there's one day where people aren't having to agree to work, you know, yeah. where it's like, <laughs> hell yeah, we are so it. freaking excited. <laughs> and, it, you know, it isn't pushed on you by an initiative. But at this moment in time, we need it because yeah. it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I was. Uh, uh, just thinking about um, you know sort of women in the lead roles as well because I uh, was always aware that there was a disparity between you know how many uh, protagonists are, are, are leading protagonists in the movie are, are women and I always knew there was a disparity between men and women but I didn't realize how pronounced it was and I read a few articles where it was you know they were dramatically stating you know how low it was you know as low as kind of thirty percent in some in some Hollywood you know in like two thousand and sixteen. And I bizarrely, I had made a list of my favorite 500 films because I got time on my hands. And, uh, and I thought, surely, you know, this is a list which is not controversial. If you were to look at it, you'd see many of the kind of standard canonized movie classics in there across. And it dates back, the earliest in the list is about 1920, and it covers, it's a huge film nerd uh, list. And, and, I, and I sort of thought to myself, I bet there's at least 50% that are female roles. And I totted it up. And to talk of if you were thinking of it singly as a female protagonist, it was um, 50 in the 500 films. It's 10%. And I was really shocked by my own list. And again, it's not a list where you'd look at that and think it's, it's entirely Jean-Claude Van Damme films. It's, it's a very broad spectrum. But, and I was shocked by myself. And I, and I talked to my girlfriend about it. And she was saying, well, yeah, you never notice the absent because yeah. you see a white yeah. middle class male on screen all the time. You just it, The absence of something doesn't occur to you because there's nothing absent for exactly. you. Exactly. You know? I mean, even for me, though, like I took a film class in college. And it wasn't until I got in the industry and I started thinking back on it, in this film class, uh, you know, of like an entire semester, not one female director uh, was presented as somebody to, to, to watch, whose work I should watch. And, yeah. and I just didn't think about it. I was like, oh yeah, Tarantino, um, yeah, Woody Allen. I thought about it. This I is what everyone loves. I was student that was like, why is there not one woman on this list? Because when you present to me a list and you say, these are the directors you should study in film school, these are the directors who are worth watching, I was like, so what you're telling me is there's not one woman who's worth studying, and that's the message you're giving. And I was the annoying student that was always I wish that, that I thought more. I think I was just so like enamored. I never thought of even filmmaking. Yeah. I just discovered filmmaking for myself right. that I there was a pressure of being like, 
oh my God, I gotta catch up. You know, I didn't, I were, my, my family immigrated here when I was six, and so I wasn't exposed to all these art films, so I just felt like I had to catch up and yeah. learn all the things that these, like, <laughs> film teacher and all these Watch brilliant, <laughs> yeah. huh? Watch Blow Up. I was yeah. like, we are showing Blow Up one more time. We'll walk <laughs> out blow of it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why is this okay? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Guys, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. For everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.